Hey guys, it's Celine, and today is Wednesday. Yes, I can't tell nowadays because I don't always go to the market because things, you know, in town have been they're rebuilding my square, and the market has moved to the other side of town, which is not really all that interesting. The result of that is that I don't go to the market every Wednesday and since I don't really have any m bigger anchor points in my week other than that, you know, I don't know if it's Wednesday. It is Wednesday. The other thing that happens on Wednesday is that I can go to my farmer's shops that are out in the sticks where I can get my nice, uh, you know, beef and sausages and eggs and milk and milk from a farmer and then may turn that into cocoa into hot cocoa that's a whole experience i swear mm, nice so that'll be happening i'm not here to talk to you about the farmers though even though it's fun i had you know i even had a chat with one of those uh one of the ladies that happened to be able to open the door for me because they're not normally open on wednesdays and she sold me a couple of uh, pork chops as well. And so, yeah, if you're a vegetarian, this is not for you. This is not your channel, I suppose. Yeah. So, gosh, dang it. Um, I'm, I come out. Uh, I don't even know really why I'm come out except to, you know, I feel really good nowadays. I, I'm kind of scared to say it, but I've been going through a lot again. And life has just been one immense long tumo uh inner heat development going on and further from there i'm becoming i don't know if it shows but i'm becoming a bit more confident in ways that i've never really experienced before so to what extent can i identify this as confidence i don't know <laughs> i definitely have more fun in my life i have a lot of fun spinning i even I've gone into these things, so I uh, think this is really funny. This is an old dishwasher brush that I saw on Pinterest. I saw a picture, and I went like, oh, wait on. That is a way I can make one of these for myself with just, you know, there's a, normally there's like a metal sort of a brace coming out of the of the handle, and then it goes like this, and it holds this part like so. And there's the brush bits. That's how that works. So instead, that is not the organization you want for a spindle for wool. Of course, for spinning wool on. Uh, you want it to be in the same, in you know, in the middle of the thing. So hence a big screw like so. And I took off all the bristles. And I still want to also polish this a bit. And because it works, it works really well. Polish and decorate is the plan, eventually. But this works really well. I can take this hook off and, uh, you know, even ply it from the volume I make. You make very small quantities. I never got one of these before because I didn't know whether I was going to like to spin with a thing like this or not. Or it turns out... Um, I don't know if I do this the, completely in the opposite direction from everybody else, probably, because that is definitely my MO. Over the past couple of months, I have been doing quite a bit of spinning. Not during the winter, though. I need to have... What's funny for me is that I need to have a certain base level of being okay in my life to spin. To be creative in general, but in particular to spin. And the more okay I am, the more different things I can do. Writing and vlogging and or drawing or whatever else it is. You know, knitting and crochet and uh, housework even. You know, cleaning the place or getting the place straightened out a bit. Which would not be too much of a luxury. Because there's piles. <laughs> there's piles everywhere. Piles of books and I buy books and I buy stuff and it's all over the place. We can live, okay? We can manage here. It's not such a big problem. But this was a new endeavor, and I have this one as well, with just a big bead and a chopstick with a notch carved out, like so. 
and it turns out they both work really well. They work, they work differently. This one has a big uh, tendency to sort of unspin once you're, you know, once it's uh, going on. If you let it go, it turns back in the other direction again. This one doesn't do that as much. It actually produces fairly decent yarn if you have good wool, good, good fiber, that is. This is a result of uh, this one. So I made this, I spun this yarn. It's actually a two ply. There's a little bit left over there. This is a two ply yarn, as you can see, right? Uh, that I spun with this drop spindle. And I'm kind of not believing it <laughs> because it's, it's very slow, of course. And I've been watching Gillian Eve's, uh, Evie's channel, who has great information about spinning in all things spinning for years. You know, she's got tons of information of all types of spinning and she's such a professional about this. I uh, will link one of her videos or just her channel in the description to this one, because if this is your thing, you need to see what she's got because she's great. Um, I am sort of more or less on my own track with these things and I never knew, like I said, I never knew whether I was going to like spinning with a drop spindle at all. And I had seen videos and I just went ahead and fabricated this thing. And it turns out it works really well. And I can even ply from that thread and sort of make a two ply simple ball of yarn. It takes forever, but it's a real kind of a mindfulness, slow process kind of an exercise which is perfect for, I'm imagining, when I'm on holiday or out of the house, you know, and we have, I have some time left over or we're relaxing at the end of a day on a holiday or on a trip or somewhere, I can just pull this out and s spin a little bit at a time. And it's like a miniature for me. That's what it looks like. Of course, this used to be, as Gillian Evie explains in her videos much better than I can do, this used to be where all our fabric that was turned into clothes and, you know, utensils and protection of our children and everything, you know, from millennia back, it used to be the thing that this this kind of a tool you know did all the work the women doing this work there were of course dozens of them everybody spun always so f unfortunately we don't have any footage of actual i don't think other than i've seen some uh native american navajo uh ladies grandmothers also doing spinning in in their way with a, a similar kind of device to this one. And um, none of that is close to me. I mean, I'm, I live in the Netherlands, so I don't have access to any people anymore who do this kind of work from way back, like from the culture, really. The closest thing to a culturally relevant spinning process that I have is my modern spinning wheel that sits outside now because I was spinning outside in the sunshine. Um, and the production speed of one of those machines compared to this is, I don't know, times 20 or 30 or something crazy like that. It's, it's incomparable. But it does have a role to play in my life it turns out and I find I'm quite uh, pleased and sort of fascinated by how the different spinning processes each seem to be really satisfying to do and um, it just sort of helps with my life I don't know I feel so good about this you know so yeah so there <laughs> I thought this was just completely hysterically funny and it turns out you can actually use one of these. So you have to take off the brace and make sure things clean and so on. And you don't have any uh, fiber bits of the wood sticking out because these don't, they're not really made in a way that is actually very professional, I think. 
made in China, I, pro I suppose. A huge, large screw in there, like so. And, um, and it works. I'm surprised. I don't know. So maybe now, if I find other, you know, in other places, uh, I will be much more interested in going places in France whenever, you know, I get a chance on holiday, for example, to visit places that do wool processing in one form or another. If I could find, um, you know, a drop spindle that is actually made by somebody who knows what they're doing, <laughs> you know, then I can, uh, you know, maybe get one. There's, uh, they're, they're for sale on the internet. It's not impossible to get them also in, in this country. You can, uh, you can get them. And um, I've looked at some of those and I wasn't really convinced at first to, you know, it turns out I always have to try and make something first for myself. And then if I like it, you know, go from there. Because I first wanted, I don't spend money if I don't believe that I'm going to go forward with this. Now I'm, I know I'm going to go forward with this anyway. So, and you can easily use several spindles but you, because you can use them as uh, bobbins as well. If you have a spun quantity on here, you can take this um, bead off. And then if you have several more of these, you can stick them in a container and use that to ply the yarn into several, you know, in a, in a several combination. So, like this one, for example, this is another yarn that I made upstairs on my Saxony, uh, sort of classic traditional spinning wheel that actually has, which is, it's, it's a complete, you know, joy to me that I've been able to do this. Um, because it's a really consistent and very strong and I think beautiful yarn that has white, grey and dark brown separate threads. So each one was separately uh, spun and then they were plied together three at a time. And if you, I don't suppose you can really see it, if I, maybe if I go like this a bit that it will actually focus on that so you're never sure whether that happens or not at some point it should be you should be able to see uh that it has gray in the middle there and because each of those i don't know it's something you have to experience um each of those colors none of this was dyed so they're the natural colors of the sheep that this came from gray and dark and white and so I call this my Hecate yarn now because I'm all about Hecate all of a sudden. Recently I've been um, everything I have been going through with my my Tumo practice recently I've been doing quite a bit of work to um, find better ways to process uh, the, the, the emotional sort of... That recently what's been happening for me is that I've been becoming um, a lot more self-aware and what that means is that I, I was always an emotional person, funnily enough, but I had, and this is something I should also talk about separately other than in the witchy check-in, which is, you know, what I'm doing today, probably. <laughs> this is what we're doing right now here. Um, I have been battling with dissociation and depersonalization all my life. Derealization is another term that's been used. So the more time passes and I read about this stuff or I listen to other people talk about similar kinds of phenomena in their lives, I feel like I should also chip in and, you know, give you what I have been going through and how it's been working out, especially, of course, in combination with my Tumo practice that has worked wonders recently. So um, over the past couple of months, the... It is like the figure of Hecate to some extent or a figure of Hecate that I am connected to now has sort of 
kept me company and sort of presided over my process and seen to me taking initiatives or beginning, you know, um, ways of working with my energy, especially in the tumor context, that lead me to be able to be myself in a way that isn't derealized. Okay, turns out that that is probably why I am here today, <laughs> because it's a ma massive deal for me. It's like the biggest deal of my life, and I often have big things going on in my life, and I tend to be a really emotional person, and so on and so forth. But I was also carrying around with me this load, this, um, a lot of the emotional inadequacy, if you like. So anxiety and uh, reactivity and pain, simply pain and suffering and loss and grief that I was carrying around inside me. It turns out that most of it wasn't my own. Certainly, a lot of the grief I have carried around with me all my life, it wasn't my own, okay? And I have found ways, more and more, which I will go into in more detail in a separate video at some point. Turns out that it wasn't, it's not impossible to get rid of, actually get rid of the, uh, the limitations that the old grief places on us, okay? And it's still kind of raw and difficult to, to express, really, because with the Tumo, actually, you get real change. So I become more self-aware. It means more pain. Then I have to decide which part of this pain I need to actually process as being, you know, my own path and Dang it, you know, I was in these kinds of impossible situations all my life and that is a problem and that caused me pain. Yes, I'm okay with that part, but there's more, 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 more pain. And I don't know if this is just me. I don't know. I do know that my husband has the same kind of MO about him of drawing in everybody's grief. If this is you, sign your name, okay? In... <laughs> sign give me a a duck uh, <laughs> a duck emoji in the in the comments if you like some of us draw everybody's grief out and we're triggered by everybody's grief it's all about triggers of course all the time and it turns out that it isn't always um most of the time there's only a part of it that is our own and when, for example, my MO has always been to get really upset when things go wrong or when, especially when I hurt myself, for example, I am quite capable of running into something or slapping my hand against something and I will curse the night dark. <laughs> I will curse the sky, okay? I will get so upset and so angry, but it turns out that that is like a pressure cooker or a, a, a kettle that whistles to let out some of the overpressure that is in there. And what comes out as anger, it isn't underneath, it, it's not anger at all, it's only grief. And there I found that a lot of the grief is just that none of my ancestors ever talked about anything that mattered to them. It was always the predictable path. It was always the safe little path, you know, that they talked about and they didn't share anything else really ever. Not my dad, not my mum, not their parents, not nobody. Nobody does that. It's also a bit the... You know, the culture where we come from, everybody's really quiet. And um, I don't know anybody who isn't, you know, very self-contained and controlled and <laughs> very mature about everything and quiet and restrained, you know, all that stuff. So underneath all that, turns out that there was all this 
this grief and I was in a state where to describe sort of hopefully in five minutes no more uh, the process that I went through I was in a state where it turns out that the grief I was feeling the the state of how I kept experiencing the same grief that I had phases where I could just cry and cry and cry and I nearly I could cry for an hour and nothing would change inside you know I just kept feeling this overwhelm and this and ugh, you know it was just sometimes it, it's kind of healthy to you know cry or let it out sure I'm not against that at all but I did feel that there were stages and points where it was just clawing at me in here and it, it hurts and and I sort of felt that in here, and that's probably the part that I really need to just, you know, bring the focus on here, is that in here, in our hearts and our thymus area, so our higher heart chakra, whether it's vibrational and or physical or both, I think it's both actually, this is where ancestral problems are stored. If we are super sensitive, it will hurt in there or it will feel completely numb at first. That's a possibility. And doing the TUMO, if you have never heard me talk about TUMO before, there is a playlist on my channel and I talk about TUMO as in inner heat practice, Kundalini yoga kinds of, you know, approaches all the time on my channel. Um, I refer you back to those. That is what I do to sort of dig into those kinds of parts of me and the more it hurts the more there's something I have to do about it and in this particular case so yesterday actually you know I was um having this sense that I had I I sort of have this millstone around my neck literally of everybody's unprocessed feelings from centuries back really and to such an extent where it goes where it all goes sort of really bad on us is that in here there is also your most fundamental sense of yourself in your life and that is where the dissociation and the depersonalization bit comes in. See where I'm going with this? It does eventually make sense when I'm rambling on about. So activating this with the inner heat eventually brings more self-awareness. It takes you out of the cocoon, if you like, the shell of of the trauma that was apparently completely plastered over my my own self-awareness and freezing me up and I didn't even know that because I could think and I could talk and I had emotions to some extent but it was always sort of around the side and you know bypassing this whole part of me so it 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 doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it, that's a, that's how my life used to be. I used to go through the motions. And nowadays, that is all different. And I used yesterday, what I did yesterday was I used the TUMO to go literally into like a spinning vortex of the, of the past, where... What I got to see, kind of a visualization mainly, is that I carry with me this fabric of everybody's vibrational life, as it were, in my own. Makes To me, it makes sense that you would not be isolated. One reason why I had to do this or had to go for this is that my sense of connecting to people now or to my own family and to my own ancestors and my parents has been completely messed up because of all this history, all this back, back story here. 
and so I cannot even connect to my own mother without having this grief again. You know, I cannot feel connected to people without the whole grief thing coming towards me like a big elephant, like a massive, huge, great monster. <laughs> and I was so fed up. I was so, I was so ready to be, I don't want to identify with grief all my life. So what I saw was this vortex and a whole a lot of the spinning activities and the spin spindles and the, you know, the the wool going like that <laughs> all the time. That was definitely a whole part of this whole image that I had. And I uh, kind of sort of, I it, it's like going back in time, okay? And I sent my own tumor in there. It's kind of like chud even, you know, into the past with the instruction to filter out all the experiences and leave what it is that I, their proper self, you know, what it is that I'm actually connected to. So not the noise, not the stops and band-aids that, ever, you know, all this damage all the scar tissue in the vibration then if that makes any sense that i was looking at it was like a tapestry except circular you know and it had it it, it had so many very tight knots in it like fist size <laughs> kinds of disasters of yarn if you like, if you're a fabric person, you know what I mean. Like a knitting process completely gone round the bend and everything gone, all the, you know, everything's tied to each other very tightly. I couldn't see the people because that stuff was in the way. And after sort of letting the tumor get in there and just putting it in there and letting it sort itself, sort you have to trust your own Shakti, your own Kundalini strength for that matter. That is a huge deal in this kind of thing. You have to trust it. And then after a while, it was like in the middle, I got a sense of a very fine white, yellow, bright fiber. You know, like a bit like this, but very... Uh, very bright and shiny and like yellow and green and white, basically. Uh, very fine fluff coming out. And those, those little fibers are the actual connections to the actual people. Back in time, you know, going back in time. So small wonder that I, I don't know where that brings me. I mean, whether that brings me anywhere good or any whether any, any more information about those people is going to come out we will see where that goes from here you know but i do feel life has become more and more real this way i'm sharing this part of the process also because it every I, everybody i listen to on on youtube or on the internet has a story to tell and everybody's part of this huge tapestry and with those impossible big um, scars everywhere, you know? It's insane. It's so, this is so beautiful. You don't really see the colors that much. It has a lot of color. Pink and lilac. It's gorgeous. So fiber art and chud and tumo and freedom as a result and I um, you have to break off those scars that don't work for you because none of this really was part of my own experience what my experience is I am dealing with on my own terms of course that is not what I'm saying here it's the other bit the intangible anxiety that is the hard part. That is where I'm where I'm working on here. Okay. So I'm going to leave it at this. 
Um, I hope this is worth watching. Thank you for watching if you were still here. And maybe it's useful to somebody out there. And, uh, you know, good luck. Good luck to you. And uh, see you again next time. Okay? Bye for now. Bye-bye.